Now, I'm going to cover four topics. First of all, who are the sons of God talked about in Genesis chapter 6? And they were the fathers of the Nephilim. Second, we will talk about the origin of the Nephilim. Third, we will talk about what or who are the Nephilim. And fourth, we will talk about the relationship of the Nephilim to UFOs and to non-physical entities. So let's start with who are the sons of God. What I'm giving is my understanding, my worldview, which I believe comports with the biblical worldview, which is not standard Christian doctrine. It is not standard evangelical teaching. Parts of it you will find with technical specialists and linguists, but you will not find this anywhere as I present it. So let's start with Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4. We'll go back later to Genesis 6 verses 1 to 3 also. But verse 4 says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So let's analyze this verse and take it apart. It starts, there were giants in the earth in those days. Now the word giants in Hebrew is the word Nephilim. This is a plural term. Then we're going on in verse 4. And also after that, when the sons of God, we're going to pause here, and it actually says, sons of the Elohim in the Hebrew, with the definite article. And I believe when the definite article appears with Elohim, the Elohim, it's referring to uh, Yahweh almost exclusively. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, the word men is actually Adam. Now, the word Adam is singular with a definite article. It means the Adam, the name of the first man, and also it is a designation of human beings descended from from Adam. Now, I, in other words, Adam is the superlative human term, superlative Hebrew term, indicating and defining a human being as opposed to some other kind of being. There are other Hebrew words that generally relate to mankind, but sometimes those words are used for other non-human entities. So this phrase could be translated, the daughters of the Adam, the Adam. The purpose of Genesis 6-4 is clearly to distinguish the Nephilim from the sons of God and from the daughters of men. And going on in chapter 6 and verse 4. And they bear children to them. Now, The word children is in the King James. It does not occur in Hebrew. It is implied. So the phrase should actually be, and they bear to them. Uh, So the Net Bible, which is on the Internet, note 14 in Genesis 6 and verse 4, says the masculine plural suffix them refers to the sons of God to whom the daughters of men bore children. So the word children is not incorrect, it's just not in the text. When it says they bear to them, it obviously means that they bear offspring. And then it going on in Genesis 6-4, and they bear children to them, the same, referring to the Nephilim, became mighty men. Now the word mighty men, Men is actually a single word in Hebrew, gibor. In in uh, the plural, it would be giborim, which is what it is here. 
the term is plural in the Hebrew in this in this uh, instance. These giborim, someone who could fight well and perform great deeds. At the end of Genesis 6 and verse 4 it says, became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Now men of renown in the, is the Hebrew word, a single word, enosh, not Adam, and it relates and has a meaning here of fame and mortality. So, in this one verse, you have three words that are distinguished from each other, and they're very precise in their meaning in Scripture. You have Adam, you have Gibor, and Enosh. The first usage of men is Adam. The, a generic term for human beings, for mankind. It is also the personal name of the first man created in Genesis. The second term for men is gibor, used for men is giborim. It means mighty men, powerful men, men of uh, great ability. David, the third, um, yeah. uh, King David had um, a gibor uh, that was in his employ. Yeah, he had several. Yeah. Many, many mighty men. Yeah. Now, they were normal humans. Uh, <clears throat> but they were just as, and they killed, we'll get into that, they actually killed the giants that were in David's time. Uh -huh. the, the third term, Enosh, is plural, and it means mortal men of renown or famous men. So that these individuals, their fame went through the flood. And as uh, I would refer people back to the uh, s the works of uh, Robert Bowie Johnson, uh, you know, the post-flood and pre-flood people. Uh, so what is man? And I want to, you know, what is a human being? I want to shift quickly to Psalm chapter 8. Uh, which is a Davidic psalm, and it says, What is man, and here the term is Enosh, or mortal, what is man that you, talking about Yahweh from Psalm 8 and verse 1, that you, Yahweh, are mindful of him, and the son of man, in this case the word man is Adam, that you visit him. In this case, Enosh and Adam is a repetition and a description the next verse, it says in verse 5 of Psalm 8, For you, again Yahweh, you have made him little lower than the angels, and have crowned him with glory and honor. Now, in the Hebrew, this word angels does not occur. The word is Elohim. You have made him a little lower than the Elohim. Talking about Adam and Enosh and have crowned him with glory and honor. Psalm 8 and verse 5. It should read, You, Yahweh, have made him a little lower than the gods. Now, we are not gods now. That's obvious. I know I'm not. I don't well, think um, you are either, George Wall, Wall Street guys think they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> In verse 6, of Psalm 8. You have made him, in this case, him referring to Adam, you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. And that means everything, even supernatural beings that exist. And you have put all things under his feet. Again, referring to Adam, to man, mankind. Now, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, in the New Testament, this Psalm verse, uh, Psalm 8 verse 6 passage focuses directly to Jesus Christ in Hebrews 1 and verse 2 and especially chapter 2 and verse 8. But it still applies to the sons of Adam and to all of us eventually. Next I want to look at who are the sons of God. Well, let's look at Job chapter 
38, which discusses the sons of God. <clears throat> Job chapter 38, verses 4 to 7. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Then continuing on, who has laid the measures thereof? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You can also look at uh, Job 26, verse 7. Now these sons of God, and by the way, it's the same Hebrew phrase that's used in Genesis 6. <coughs> these sons of God were present at the time of creation when Yahweh laid the foundations of the earth, as it says. Oh, this is not me or you shouting for joy in an earlier or an, a reincarnated life, an earlier reincarnation. That's, that's ridiculous and unbiblical. This refers to a group of beings in Hebrew, the Benai Ha Elohim, and yet it all relates to the Nephilim, as we will see. The sons of God are not human and are not of Adam. They existed when the earth was formed. So this totally wipes out the idea that the sons of God <coughs> are in any way humans. You know, the sons of of God who were supposedly of of uh, Seth and they bred with the daughters of men and uh, you know these giants produced well humans mating with humans do not ordinarily breed giants and giants today don't ordinarily breed multiple generations of giants as we shall see <clears throat> so that wipes out the human concept that the sons of God are human but Job 26 in verse 7 says that the earth hangs upon nothing. And it is a falsehood that ancient people thought that the earth was flat. Job knew that it was not. Job was probably one of the first complete books set down to writing. Genesis was a compiled work of shorter, older documents than the book of Job. Now, how did Job know this information? Well, Job 38, verses 4 to 7, was something that God himself, Yahweh, told Job, probably through the angel of the Lord, face to face, from a cloud, or however he did it. You can judge for yourself if this is legitimate. I believe it is. So, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. <clears throat> Now that we have an idea that the sons of God are not human, look at Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4, and note the symmetry, how verse 1 relates to verse 3, and verse 2 relates to verse 4. And it came to pass when the, when the men, Adam in this case, began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God, sons of Elohim, saw the daughters of men, daughters of Adam, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, with Adam, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years commonly understood and I believe correctly that from when God made this statement to Noah there would be 120 years left <clears throat> verse 4 there were giants the Nephilim in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of Elohim came unto the daughters of Adam and they bore children to them the same became mighty men Gibor which were of old men of renown, Enosh. So there you have the complete picture. If you, And here is you have an even more complete picture if you relate verse 2 and verse 4 together. And I'm going to quickly read them in sequence. 
which brings us to the origin of the Nephilim, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all they chose. There were giants, there were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, daughters of Adam, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men, which were of old the men of renown. The term <clears throat> took wives, or wife, took a wife, occurs very frequently in Hebrew. The sons of God married these women, and this is what you get also in the Greek myths, that they, often they married them, not all the time. Now notice something in verse 4, where it says, and also after that. What is the text talking about here? Well, there are pre-flood Nephilim in those days, and then there are the there were the post-flood Nephilim, and also after that. They erupted. The whole, uh, yeah. Yeah. What book is it? Is it, they're in Numbers? Yeah, and we'll we'll cover those passages. Oh, good. Because it specifically talks about them. Yeah. This whole section of Genesis six verses one to four is contributing and leading up to why the flood was necessary. It wasn't just because of what the sons of God did. It was because of the evil of the children of Adam, all of them. And the sons of God just sped up the process, actually. Now, verses 1 and 3 of Genesis 6 and elsewhere talk about the evil of humanity, while verses 2 and 4 of Genesis 6 say that there was an extra evil committed by the Benai Elohim, the sons of God. Almost all cultures have a flood tradition. And <clears throat> most of those also have a tradition of giants. Other authors have noted this. All the original Nephilim who were not killed by violence before the flood were killed in the flood. It says, in Genesis 7, verse 22, All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Could not the sons of God have taken their children up? Apparently they did not. Most traditions, flood traditions, say that only eight were saved. As Genesis 6, verse 18 Genesis 7, verse 13, and 1 Peter 3, and verse 20 say, Now, after the flood, the sons of God again mated with the daughters of men. It says that in verse 4, and also after that. This is not difficult linguistic material. This is a straightforward reading of the text. If it's not referring to the post-flood period, what is that phrase referring to? and also after that. It says there were giants in the earth in those days. So why did we get the word giants translated from the Hebrew word Nephilim? Well, Nephilim was translated by the Greeks, especially by the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint or the LXX. They used the Greek word gigantes, the Latin Vulgate kept that transliterated Greek word gigantes when Jerome translated Genesis from Hebrew into Latin. He kept that Greek word gigantes because apparently that's what giants, that's the same word they used in Latin. Hence, we have the word giants in the King James Version. In my opinion, it would have been better if they had just left the term, transliterated it as Nephilim. So now let's look at the Israelite spies. I want to discuss the spies sent, that were sent to the Promised Land. Moses sent 12, 12 men to scout the land before Israel entered it, entered the Promised Land. Upon their return, ten of the spies said the situation was impossible. We don't want to go there. These people are too many. 
They're too dangerous, and they're too huge. Only two of the twelve spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, let's go. Let's seize the land. God had said, he will drive these people out, and we need not worry about them. This is all in Numbers chapter 13. By the way, Israel did not have to kill all the people, the Canaanites, and all the people that were already in the promised land. God said that he would drive them out. But because of their sins, God made Israel do it. Because of Israel's sins, he made them do it. In a sense, God says, I offered, you sinned, therefore as part of the punishment that you agreed to, you must kill the people occupying my land yourself. You have to kill the women and children and the men and even the animals in many cases. And when the sp- <clears throat> But back to the spies. When the spies first went in, it says they, quote, came unto Hebron, where Achim, Achimon, Sheshai, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now, who who are these individuals? Hebron is about forty is about twenty miles south southwest of Jerusalem. Well, there's a fella of Arba called Arba, who was of Adam, a human being. He was the father of Anak. And then several generations occur. And then we come to Ahiman, Sheshai, and Telmai. And they were giants. But they were not direct children of Anak. They were several generations down. Which indicates that these, these giants could breed successfully. They were not like mules. Although actually some mules can uh, breed successfully. It's just rare. Uh, They actually had several generations. They were several generations down from Anak. Continuing with the spies in Numbers 13, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children, or in Hebrew it's more precise, it's the sons of Anak there. Then in verses 31 to 33, For they are stronger than we, and they brought up an evil report, and all the people that we saw in it are men, Enosh, of great stature. And we saw the giants, Again, in the Hebrew, it is Nephilim. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the Nephilim, come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Now, it says later that these three brothers who were of the Anakim were driven out of the Hebron area by Caleb and his people in Joshua chapter 15, verse 14. After Joshua died, these three brothers, these three giants, were killed by the men of Judah. So now let's look at the giant by the name of Og, termed, called Og of Bashan in Deuteronomy. Og was of the Rephaim, who were different but similar to the Anakim and the Nephilim. The sons of God were the gods of the pagan nations. They produced offspring who were considered by pagan peoples as demigods. People like Hercules, Dionysus, Osiris, Gilgamesh, and all others who became bastardized in the pagan myths, they were probably actual biblical characters, as Robert Bowie Johnson shows us. Some were giants and some weren't. Uh, As it says in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 11, For only Og 
king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. The word giants here is from the Hebrew word Rephaim. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It is not in Rabbath, is not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon, or is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? In other words, after the Og of Bashan died, the bed survived, the bedstead. Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Now, regarding the bedstead of iron, they had iron as early as the Exodus period. And this is, uh, iron was first mentioned in Genesis 4, in verse 22, before the flood. Either Noah or one of his sons brought the technique of smelting iron with them after the flood, or it was reinvented. The Hebrew term for iron is used 70 times in the Old Testament. It's used 10 times in Mosaic writings, and it's even used in the book of Job. Job 20, verse 24. He shall flee from the iron weapon, and the bow of steel shall strike him through. Of course, steel wasn't made in those days. Uh, Let's see, where was it? No. Okay, that's something else. Okay. Um, bronze was still more effective for weapons in the time of the Exodus because they were not able to work iron and harden iron until later. They were able to use iron, but not as weapons during the time of Judges. In the time of Judges, they were perfecting iron and making it harder to make arrowheads, swords, and spearheads of iron. In the time of the Exodus, iron was very expensive and very difficult to make. But I've had a historian tell me, yes, you see iron mentioned in the Iliad of Homer, which was traditionally dated about 1300 B.C., and also you see iron in the time of David. Now, in the time of the judges, the Philistines removed all of the iron-making tools of the Israelites. The Philistines invaded the land of Palestine and took all of the, the kilns and furnaces so that the Israelites could not make iron weapons like the Philistines. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19 to 22. The Israelites continued to use bronze weapons. But back to Og. Uh, his bedstead was made of iron. It was nine cubits in length and four cubits in width, after the cubit of a man. A cubit of a man was roughly from the tip of your finger to your elbow, about 18 inches, maybe 15 inches minimum. Therefore, if a cubit is roughly 18 inches, we can estimate that his bedstead was thirteen and a half feet long and about six feet wide. Considering that his bed was probably longer than he was, you can figure him to be probably about ten, twelve feet tall. Now let's look at Goliath and his relatives. It says in First Samuel 17 and verse 4, And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines called Goliath of Gath, whose, weight, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span makes him almost ten feet tall. So you only have these two examples where a a relatively uh, relative measurements are given. But there is actually you could say that there's a diminution diminution of the size of the giants from Og to Goliath. But still, ten feet tall is quite large. It says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 51, that Goliath was a champion, a gibor, a mighty man. That means he was a bulky man. Now, it's interesting that in the movie Troy, which I thought was a lot of fun, Achilles killed a powerful giant warrior with his small hand sword. 
and that was another way uh, that is another way other than David's method but Achilles was also considered a hybrid mighty man but he was of normal size and that is at least that is what the Greek myths say take that for what it's worth and yet in other places you have that the two warring tribes the Trojans and the Greeks were prodigious in strength and they could throw these huge rocks and things uh, so you know it, when you get to biblical non-biblical material things get confused so it's also interesting that in 1 Samuel 17 verse 54 it says that David brought Goliath's head to Jerusalem now why did he do that I don't know it also says that he possessed Goliath's sword according to 1 Samuel 21 and verse 9 and 1 Samuel 22 and verse 10 and Goliath's armor 1 Samuel 17 verse 54 now the Hebrew term translated armor in 1754 is variously rendered as armor or weapons it may indicate general military gear but if David's tomb is would be discovered, and I believe it is in Jerusalem and intact, if Goliath's head is in the tomb, what else would David do with it? It could be buried in one of those chambers. After all, it was his first significant accomplishment. And DNA could be extracted from the tooth enamel of Goliath to see what kind of genetic material he had in him. See if it would be different than normal, regular human beings. Now, there were other Philistine Rephaim giants during the time of David who were also killed by his Giborim, his David's mighty men. But David's men weren't giants. Now, at least four of these, there were at least four others besides Goliath. Second Samuel 21, verses 15 to 22, according to the Net Bible. It's just, uh, it clarifies things in that translation. In verses 15 to 17, it says, Ishi Benob. He's an individual who had a spear, meaning the spear head, that weighed 300 bronze shekels. The spear head was 7.5 pounds. And he said that he would kill King David. And uh, he failed. He did not. Uh, verse 18 of Second Samuel, verse 21. It says, A Philistine warrior named Saph, also First Chronicles 20 and verse 4, David's men killed him. I think they probably just drove away the other Philistines and surrounded the guy and killed him. In verse 19, it talks about Elhanan. He killed the brother of Goliath the Hittite. That's Elhanan, who was one of David's mighty men. The shaft of Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. This is also talked about in First Chronicles 20 and verse 5. And uh, the Net Bible translators insert the phrase, the brother of, but it's not really in the Hebrew. And this is because Second uh, Samuel 21, 19 simply says Goliath, but First Chronicles 20 and verse 5 clarifies this and says, the brother of Goliath. This is why you have to read Chronicles and Kings together. And some people think, oh, well, this was a mistake in Scripture. No, it's just that one, one uh, account was more expansive than the other. So his spear was so thick and so heavy, he probably also used it as a club this uh, brother of Goliath the Gittite. Verses 20 to 21 of Second Samuel 21. A large man, and here it uses the term ish, or male, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 digits, 24 in all, talking about his digits. Well, David's brother slew him, and this is also in First Chronicles 20 and verses 6 to 7. And then in uh, going on, it says, These four were born to the giant, or to the Rapha, in Gath. 
and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, regarding the fellow with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, uh, this is a condition called polydactyly. It occurs rarely, but it does occur. And if such breeding of Rephleem is still going on, I suppose they've bred this out of their, you know, their progeny. Uh, oop, what happened here? Okay. Um, search the internet for polydactyly and you'll see some lovely photos of both hands and feet with six or more digits. And these are not doctored or fake photos. You will see them in medical textbooks that have similar photos. The occurrence of polydactyly is well understood by modern medicine and it has no relationship in particular to either giantism or hybridity. The writers of Second Samuel and First Chronicles were reporting the facts. So, Georgianne, I, I need to take a break here just a moment. Let's pause the tape. <laughs> okay. Okay. I need to use Okay, we're back. Okay. So now we're going to discuss specifically who are the Nephilim and solve the mystery, actually, of who they are, now that we've got background. The book of Joshua talks about Caleb, the other faithful spy, along with Joshua. Joshua, of course, took over, was given leadership of the tribes of Israel after Moses died. Caleb was given an inheritance of the children of Judah according to the command of Yahweh. Joshua was to give Caleb the territory he requested because Caleb was faithful to God. It says this in Joshua 15, verse 13. And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah according to the commandment of Yahweh to Joshua. Even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. Remember, Hebron's 20 miles southwest of uh, Jerusalem. Notice that Arba was the father of Anak. Previously, in the book of Joshua, Arba was discussed. Joshua 14, verse 15. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man, a great Adam, among the Anakims. So how do we read this? How do we look at this verse? Does this mean that Arba was an Adam among the hybrid Anakim? These verses say that Arba was not just a great man, but he was the father of Anak. The Anakim were the children of Anak, and the Anakim were hybrids. And some researchers do not like this designation of hybrid, but that's what they were, as we shall see. This verse, does Joshua 14 and verse 15, does not say that Arba was a son of God, a Benai Ha Elohim. So Arba must have been a Nephilim because we established earlier from Numbers 13, verses 32 to 33, that Nephilim are Anakim, and vice versa. Therefore, Arba was an Anakim and of Adam. Again, to be clear, a son of Anak equals a human being. They were human, just like you and just like me. All Anakim are human because Arba was of Adam. Again, Joshua 14, verses 14 to 15. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed Yahweh, God of Israel, and the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great Adam, a great man among the Anakims, 
and the land had rest from war. Now, Hebron is 20 miles south of Jerusalem. The valley of Hebron was known as the valley of the Rephaim, right in the middle of where the city of Hebron is. See how this all ties together. The name of Hebron, prior to the time when it was changed, was Kirjoth Arba. Was Arba merely a human being? Was he also a hybrid Anakim? We know from Goliath that there were multiple generations. He had a brother. There were others. Uh, their parentage isn't exactly told us, but there were, you know, there were many such giants, such Nephilim. These men could successfully breed. They were not like mules. They could breed successive generations, which is exactly what we have described here in Joshua. Once a Nephilim was born, he could further breed with other human beings, and this is to be expected because they themselves were classified in Joshua 14, verse 15, as being of Adam, human beings. Once the sons of God mated with the daughters of men, the first generation was an Adam. Caleb drove the three Anakim brothers from Kirj Kirjath Arba, according to Judges 15, verse 14. And this happened before Joshua died. Joshua 24, verse 30, and Judges 1 and verse 1. Those three bro Anakim brothers were later killed during the early period of the Judges. But even later, some, but even then, some survived. They must have, others, giants, must have escaped to reside in the cities of the Philistines, particularly the city of Gath, up to and into the reign of King David of Israel. This all ties together. Now there is no mention of Rephaim from the time of Joshua and Caleb until Goliath, a period of some 400 years. During this time, Samson was a judge in Israel, and I believe he was a Giborian, but not a giant. Samson was a judge in Israel who fought against the Philistines who were oppressing Israel. And yet there is no record in the Bible of Samson having any encounters with any Nephilim, Rephaim, or Anakim. I cannot explain it, but, you know, we just have to take things the way they are. The entire book of Deuteronomy, you have to remember, is a retrospective by Moses of the entire exodus and wilderness experiences of the people of Israel written just before he, Moses died. It talks about the various giant peoples that the Israelites encou will encounter in the land. Deuteronomy chapter 2 verses 10 to 11 quote, The Amims dwelt therein in times past, talking about the times of Jacob and Esau, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which, talking about the Amims, which also were accounted giants, here the Hebrew term is Rephaim, were, also were accounted Rephaim as the Anakim, but the Moabites called them Amims. In other words, different peoples called these giants by different names. The Moabites called them Emims. The people from Hebron called them Anakim. Others were calling them Rephaim, which seems to have been a general term for these tall, strong, and very rough people. So let's look at now verses 20 to 21 of Deuteronomy chapter 2. Quote, 
that also was accounted a land of giants, a land of Rephaim. Giants, or Rephaim, dwelt therein in old time. And the Ammonites, Ammonites, called them Zamzus, Zamzumim, talking about east of the, of the um, Dead Sea and the Jordan River, called them Zam, Zamzumims, a people great and many and tall, as the Anakims. But Yahweh destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead. Everyone had their own local name for these big boys, a people great and many. They were not only large, they were numerous in the times of Moses and Joshua. While God destroyed them through the people of, through the actions of people of Israel, perhaps the sons of God continued their post-flood breeding with the daughters of men. Why did not God put a stop to this? He does, does so in a way, as we shall see later. And uh, let me check something real quick here. Uh, remember, oh, okay, we will... We will go. We do cover that. I was wondering if I should mention this now. So we're good. let's look at the land of the Met Rephaim. In Deuteronomy three verses verse thirteen, it says, "And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, that we dealt with earlier, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob." with all Bashan, which was called the land of the Rephaim, <coughs> or the giants. Now let's look at Joshua 12 and verse 4, and also Joshua 13 and verse 12. And the coast of Og of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants, of the Rephaim, that dwelt in Ashtaroth and at Edrai. So the northern part of this territory, south of Jerusalem, extends west to the Mediterranean coast. It begins close to the Valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, part of Jerusalem actually, the area known as Gehenna, near Jerusalem. You have in sequence Jerusalem, the Valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, the city of David, where Gehenna will take place. Gehenna will occur in the Valley of Hinnom, but there is no eternal hell. Forget about that fallacy. And that is the place of punishment south of Jerusalem in the city of David. Further south still is the land of the Rephaim. Now, I want to have an insert here that note the marriages or the matings of the sons of God and the daughters of men, daughters of Adam need not have continued not all Anakim were killed during the time of Joshua the Bible shows that several must have fled from the area of Hebron south of Jebus or Jerusalem to the Mediterranean coastal area of the Philistines near Ashdod and even Gath which was some 12 miles inland from the coast. It says in Joshua 11, verses 21 to 22, quote, And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua and Caleb, destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained. End quote. Therefore the Anakim, who were working and fighting for the Philistines, continued to marry local women, for several more generations, up to the time of David and Goliath, about twelve, about 1025 B.C., God told Israel 
that he would drive out the inhabitants from the land he promised to Israel. But they provoked God, they were stubborn, they rebelled, they sinned, and broke their covenant with, with him. Therefore, God required Israel to drive out or kill the inhabitants, according to Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 to 24. So let's look at the evidence so far, thus far. What can we conclude from what has been presented? We have several groups of, we have several groups. First is the Nephilim, second is the Anakim, third is the Rephaim, and fourth is the Emims or the Zamzuzim, who seem to be related to the Anakim. We know from Numbers chapter 13 verse 33 that the Nephilim are the Anakim, and this identification is very powerful as close to an identity as can be made. And I'm going to read this verse again because we have the, the phrase, the sons of Anak. Before that phrase is used, it talks about the, that they are Nephilim. And after that phrase is used, it repeats and says that they are uh, of the Nephilim. Numbers 13, verse 33. And there we saw the giant, the Nephilim, giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the Nephilim, of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, some writers on this subject deny this association in Numbers 13, verse 33, because it was said by the ten rebellious Israelite spies. It was not said by Joshua and Caleb. However, this is a factual statement of the reconnaissance of the spies, which includes their description of the Nephilim, the giants. And that description is nowhere contradicted by Joshua or Caleb or by Moses or by God himself. The slander that God mentions in Joshua, I'm sorry, in Numbers chapter 14, verses 36 to 38, has to do with their slander of the land that God mentions in Numbers 13, verse 32. And not specifically regarding anything regarding the giants. They said the evil, t the ten evil spies said the land itself was evil and would devour the people of Israel. This meant that, is that God brought Israel to the promised land to kill them. That was his intention. Why did In God do that? Because the Israel sinned. Why didn't God kill Israel, you mean? No, why or, didn't God kill uh, whatever it was he wanted to kill? Because as we read in Deuteronomy, or, or you can read in Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 9, yeah, verses 1 to 24, he offered to do that, that the people sinned against God, and he said, okay, you have to kill them. I'll drive them out through you rather than me driving them out ourselves. <laughs> and because the ten spies, ten rebellious Israelite spies, essentially lied, God killed the ten spies while Joshua and Caleb lived, and the people of Israel had to wander around the wilderness I think everyone except the uh, people over 20 or something, uh, children over 20, had to would die in the wilderness for 40 years. Oh, now note the author of this verse, Numbers 13:33, which talks about the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. Moses wrote that, or later an authoritative editor such as Joshua or Samuel surrounds the term Anakim between two uses of the word Nephilim. Why did he do that? To reduce any possible ambiguity and to make it clear that there is a very close association between Nephilim and Anakim, even though they are separated in time. Now, let's look at the point that the Rephaim are like the Anakim. 
Now, this identify this identification is not as powerful, but it is still quite strong. Terms of close comparison are used. Now, we also need to look at that the Nephilim are like the Rephaim, Emims, or Zamumims. These identifications are the weakest because the association to Nephilim comes through their, their identification with the Anakim. So you have Nephilim are definitely Anakim, and the others, the Rephim, Emims, and Zabzumzims, Zabzum, 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 <laughs> are, <laughs> they are associated with the Anakim. Okay? So we cannot make precise identification of Nephilim with the Rephim and the others, but it certainly looks very close. And as we have, in other words, you can't say more than what Scripture says. And as we've seen before, the Rephaim are associated very closely with the Anakim, and the Anakim are Nephilim. So as you read these texts, it seems that the Rephaim were considered to be Nephilim, although this is not directly stated. Only Moses, of the several writers referring to the giant people groups, only Moses equated Nephilim with the Anakim. The others used phrasing that pointed out similarities of the one group being like another. And these gradate, and there are actually gradations of likeness in logic. First of all, two things can be like, but almost identical. Second, two things can be like, but are similar in some points. Or, two things can be alike in one characteristic, but they are, in fact, actually very different. And any time a comparison is made, the things compared cannot, by definition, be identical. But they can be almost identical. And I think uh, Deuteronomy... Uh, 1333 comes as close as, as you can to that situation. So other than the Anakim, the extent of similarity between Nephilim and the other giants cannot be determined from the texts. As I said, Nephil Numbers 1333 identifies Nephilim with Anakim. Moses related the term Nephilim specifically by using that term to the pre-flood world of Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4. While the manifestation of Anakim, who were large, according to the observation of all 12 spies, they were the... Remember, Joshua did talk about the Anakim, not in the Numbers um, 1333 episode, but in, his own, in the book of Joshua. He... And so he confirmed what what Moses said earlier in Numbers thirteen thirty three. They were the the Anakim were the post flood outbreak of these giants. Now, let's talk about the dispersion of the nations at Babel and the old gods. After the flood, <clears throat> at the city of Babel, languages were confused. God also separated the nations at that time. This event has significance to the Rephaim and the giant peoples that inhabited the promised land. It says in Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 to 9, So Yahweh dispersed them, meaning the human beings, from over, dispersed them from there, from Babylon, from Babel, over the face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. And from there, Yahweh dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Then look at a very interesting passage in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 to 9. This is a straightforward narrative as Moses understood it. Remember, Deuteronomy is Moses looking back, recalling and explaining all the events that happened from the time, in this case, from Babel, up to the point just before Moses died. 
Deuteronomy 32, 8, quote, When the Most High, first of all, divided to the nations their inheritance. Two, when he separated the sons of Adam. Three, he set the bounds of the people, or peoples, plural, according to the number of the sons, children of Israel. For Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his, his inheritance. Now, that, fra- that phrase, according to the number of the sons of, of the children of Israel, does not make any sense. We talking about 70 children of Israel that went into Egypt? Are we talking about the 12 sons of uh, Jacob, the, also the children of Israel? What are we talking about? Well, this, David, in um, one of my old, old Bibles that I have, it says that uh, they were divided according to the number of the sons of God. Yes, exactly. And that's what we're getting to. Okay. I'm going to explain how this, this works out. Um, and this is somewhat technical, but it's clear that the phrase, children of Israel, Benai is Israel, is in the Hebrew, that it is definitely in the Hebrew. However, the oldest Hebrew manuscript of the Masoretic text that we have of Deuteronomy chapter 32 was copied in the 5th century A.D. The Dead Sea Scrolls have this rendering. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people, people's plural, according to the number of the sons of God, just as you said. Uh For Yahweh's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his, his inheritance. And this is all in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it also, it's very similar to what Paul talks about in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. So the nations were divided. Well, how many nations were there? Genesis chapter 10 lists 70 nations. Sometimes it's figured as 72. Some of those names may have been, two of those names may have been repeated, uh, or they some of the individuals may have had double names, so 70 or 72. Were there 70 sons of God? I don't know, but this might make a lot of sense. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written sometime in the 4th century B.C., maybe later, many hundreds of years earlier than our oldest Hebrew manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written in Hebrew, just like the Hebrew manuscripts that we have. It and it uses the phrase Benai Ha Elohim just like Genesis six two and Genesis six four. The Greek Septuagint has the phrase according to the number of the angels of God. Now I cannot explain the discrepancy between the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. These sons of God were created beings, and they will die, and they can die. They can die and they will die. This sons of God rendering changes the entire aspect of Deuteronomy chapter 32. And there are other elements in this, in Deuteronomy, that support this understanding as well as other parts of Scripture. In Acts 17 verse 26 it says that God set the boundaries of nations and determines where peoples will live. And he moves peoples around. This, that confirms what is being what it was said in Deuteronomy 32, 8 and, 8 and 9. Acts 17, verse 26 says, And may, has made of one blood all the nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God moves the boundaries of nations just like he moves people's. And I do not like denying the validity of the Hebrew Manus- Masoretic text at all. Yet almost universally, unless you are a King James only person, technical scholars agree with the rendering sons of God. This makes sense in the text, and the Dead Sea Scrolls rendering is correct. 
There are some other Hebrew texts that say this, ben Elohim, but the apocryphal books, like Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees, uh, Josephus, and Philo, they use the angelic rendering according, they probably got it from the Septuagint. So, let's look at the, well, I don't know, George Ann, how much time do we have on this uh, presentation so far? I... Uh... You you could go about another 35 minutes. Okay, I'll try and do it. <laughs> okay. So let's look at the old gods in the world and a Davidic psalm. Most ancient traditions distinguish, have a distinction between the elder gods or the olden gods and later gods. Here are the older gods in Psalm 89 and verse 6, according to the King James Version. For who in the heaven can be compared to Yahweh? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to Yahweh? Now, Yahweh is an El. He is of the Elohim. He is the God. He is the El of Elohim. He is even termed of, as the El of Elohim with the definite article. This usage occurs several times, and he said to the Israelites repeatedly, Yahweh said, you must worship me alone. I don't care about the other peoples, but you must worship me alone, you Israelites. And only the one God should, must be worshipped by Israel, otherwise there will be problems. This is what the covenant was that they made with, with Yahweh. Worship me only, or there's going to be big trouble, and you will violate the uh, covenant. The pagan nations could worship whatever they wanted, and I mean that seriously. There was no prohibition for Gentiles, non-Israelites, to worship gods other than Yahweh. Only Israel was prohibited from worshiping other gods. Israel could only worship Yahweh. And this is why you have the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, which refers to the one God. He is talk, it is talking about the one Yahweh. The Most High God refers to Yahweh. This is why descriptors, descriptor modifying words are very important. Scripture is very precise, except in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8, unfortunately. Psalm 89.6 asks about the sons of the mighty, who can be equal to Yahweh. The sons of the mighty in Hebrew is sons of Elyon. Elyon is another descriptive term of Yahweh. For who in the heavens can be compared to Yahweh? Who among the sons of Elyon can be likened unto Yahweh? Elyon means mighty God, almighty God. Okay? Look at Psalm 82. Here we learn, as we've covered in other presentations, that gods can die. Psalm 82 is eight verses long. It, we will cover only a few of those verses. It says in, chap, in verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 82, according to the Net Bible, God, here the term is Elohim, stands in the assembly of El, in the midst of the gods, or Elohim. He renders judgment. He says, how long will you make unjust legal decisions and show favoritism to the wicked. So what does it mean, in the midst of the Elohim? This second use of Elohim in this, in this verse is plural. El is holding what is called a divine council, divine assembly. These events occur several times throughout the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, and in the book of Hebrews. The two heavenly scenes in Job chapter 1 and 2 are two examples. These assemblies of gods before El are very similar to Ugaritic descriptions of the gods holding meetings before their chief god, Il. Spelled a little differently, the vowels are different, 
Ugarit is an ancient city in Anatolia, uh, southeastern Anatolia, where Turkey today, where a large number of writings were discovered. I believe one Ugaritic writing in particular is a corruption of the quote, and it is actually quoting Psalm 82. The wording of the Ugaritic is strikingly similar when you, when you v- read them side by side. So, it says in Psalm 82, God stands in the assembly of El, in the midst of the Elohim. I know people who say that every time the Hebrew term Elohim is used, it always means the Creator God. Well, that is obviously not true and easily demonstrated. Going on, he says, How long will you, you Elohim, you subordinate Elohim, make unjust legal decisions and show favoritism to the wicked? According to the Net Bible, Psalm, uh, Psalm 82, two. The wording, uh, these Elohim are being judged and sentenced but the punishment actually came later. Psalm 82 is a judgment portion of what is called a reeb, which is a courtroom scene, and there were certain steps within the courtroom procedure. This is the punishment phase of the court courtroom procedure, and apparently the, the judgment came later. And look at my article, Elohim and the Son, Son of God, Part 1. Okay. This is acknowledged by scholars who recognize ancient law court proceedings. In other words, they can identify them. Now we come to Psalm 82, verses 6 to 8. It says in the Net Bible, I thought, and quoting, You are Elohim, all of you are sons of the Most High. Once again, Elion, Most High God. Yet you will die like men, die like Adam. You will fall like all the other rulers. Rise up, O God, and execute judgment on the earth, for you own all the nations. So the rulers of Israel, the priests and Levites and the kings, all lived in a blood cult society. The Levitical priests had to go into the temple, and they were killing sacrificial animals every day. During the feast days, hundreds of animals were killed. They knew what death was like. You never find in the Hebrew Scriptures that these people thought they were divine or that they were Elohim. To say to a human being, oh, you will die like a man, makes no sense. But if you're talking about the Elohim and the sons of Elion, talked about in Psalm 89, in heaven, in verses 82-1 and and Psalm 82-6 respectively, the sons of Elohim in Deuteronomy 32.8 and in Genesis chapter 6, who were the gods of the nations dispensing legal decisions and showing favoritism to the wicked, all of this ties together. Psalm 82 is a psalm of David. This judgment was given in this psalm during the days of David. The sentence of judgment was not fulfilled at that time until the time of Jeremiah some 400 years later. There are passages which I am still researching where within a few words of each other idols are said to have to be captured along with quote the Elohim. Are these verses talking about these entities, these gods actually being captured along with uh, actually being captured when they are in some physical state? And we know angels who are spirits can manifest themselves physically and eat like men, although we're not so... I'm just making a comparison between that, angels and the sons of God. These are probably the instances uh, in Genesis 18, verses 2 to 10, and 19, verses 1 to 3, that the Apostle Paul referred to when he said, some have entertained angels unawares. Hebrews 13, and verse 2. While... I explain elsewhere in other articles that angels are Elohim. They are nowhere called sons of Elohim or sons of Elion. Nor is Christ an angel, according to Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5. You know, so these Elohim, these sons of Elion, will die like men. 
is lesser gods can die, Elohim can and do die, only Yahweh and Christ are immortal, and Christ has been immortal only since his resurrection. If there are exceptions to this, they are unclear and not stated in Scripture. Now Christ, the Son of God, was created. He did not exist in some vague eternity past, as some traditional Christian beliefs have supposed. The other sons of God were created. The angels were created. The spirits were created. The cherubim and the were created. The seraphim were created. The elementals were created. And you are created through birth, through Adam. So, the angels are Elohim. According to the Bible, they shall die if, there's, if they sin. Yahweh is the only ultimate creator, and everything and everyone and everything else is a creation of His. There is only one God, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6. And right now, just Yahweh and Christ, by virtue of His spiritual resurrection, have immortality. Every other intelligent being is mortal. So let's look at relationships. So what is the relationship of Nephilim to UFOs and other non-physical entities? One of my favorite non-biblical authors or non-biblical commenters, commentators on this subject was John Keel. He wrote a fascinating book called Our Haunted Planet. It was first published in 1971, and it's available online, complete as a PDF file. John Keel says, uh, The mating of ordinary women with supernatural beings is an integral part of all religious lore, but it is emphasized in the Bible. Okay, and um, going on in Keel's book in a chapter titled The Demise of the Gods. The startling truth, as carefully recorded by ancient historians, is that the ultra-terrestrials have always been in direct contact with millions of individuals and that they actually ruled over mankind for many years. In recent centuries, their influence has become more subtle, but it is always there. Well, this is exactly what Deuteronomy 32.8 in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Psalm 82 say. But Keel does not draw his conclusions only from biblical sources. So, this may be the basis for also for most conspiracy theories. If these entities had been influencing, ruling, or been closely involved with mankind or whole nations in post-flood history, mostly through their rulers, religious and secular. Uh, this all makes sense. The purpose of, of man's religion is to contact God, but to do so on man's terms. Not This is not the biblical way. Do you really think the pagan religions perform their rituals and their sacrifices without getting a response from the gods? If yes is your answer, then you think the ancient peoples were stupid or deluded, and they were neither. And they were neither. Right. There's a very interesting book written by the Plutarch, who was the author of Plutarch's Lives. Uh, the Greek. He was a Greek historian. Uh, lived from 46 to 120 A.D. He was a biographer and essayist, best known for his work Plutarch's Lives. Plutarch was a priest of Delphi in Greece, and he wrote an interesting book called On the Cessation of the Oracles. He wrote this book after the time of Christ, during the latter uh, apostolic period. He noted that the major pagan oracles slowly stopped responding to people who would pay money to hear the oracle speak. His book attempted to explain why this was happening. Apparently, all pagan religions have this difficulty. Something was going on, but Plutarch had no real idea what caused the cessation of the oracles. Later, later on, these same entities often became saints of the Catholic and Orthodox Church. John Keel goes on in his book, The Haunted Planet, Chapter 15, Where Is Everybody Going? He says, quote, 
the record shows that the ultra-terrestrials have a need for physical human beings. Once they were quite open in demanding specimens to serve their needs, they once exploited the human race in the guise of benevolent gods living on hilltops. They now exploit us through the modern myth of extraterrestrial visitors from distant stars. And, what, you know, whether this was physical sacrifice or abduction or what is called a wedding of, with the gods or of the gods in which women within a pagan temple would go and have sex with the god or a possessed priest or something, they would be impregnated. Maybe, the, maybe this is how the sons of God mated with the daughters of men after the flood. I don't know. In other instances, priestesses would prostitute themselves to men in the temples. This was the nature of pagan religion. I have a friend whose mother is more than 90 years old. She grew up in what is now the Czech Republic. She told me that when she was a girl, every year during a certain saint's day in the middle of the night, a supposed female saint visited the town. The saint would come down a hillside as a light and would move through the town as a bright light. Nothing was guiding the light, no form was attached, no form would appear, just the light would pass through and then disappear. And this is similar to the type of event that Kiel describes. Similar things are described during ancient pagan rituals. The gods responded to their worshippers, and so did evil spirits, and they do so today. If you do a satanic rite or do magic to be effective, you must cooperate with spirits to get results. This is why there is such a strong biblical prohibition against such practices. The UFO story is similar. In another book by John Keel called Operation Trojan Horse, the title kind of explains what he's talking about. The UFOs present themselves as something they are not. John Keel says, and this book is also available online, complete for free on the Internet, the real UFO story must encompass all of the many manifestations being observed. It is a story of ghosts and phantoms and strange mental aberrations, of an invisible world that surrounds us and occasionally engulfs us, of prophets and prophecies and gods and demons, end quote. I agree. All phenomena must fit the worldview that you believe in. Not some of it, but all of it. And I believe the biblical worldview accurately reflects uh, what reality is. In fact, the spirit beings have nothing on you. In fact, they fear you because of what you will become when you enter the kingdom of God. You shall judge angels, good and bad, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3. They especially fear you if you have proper knowledge of them. They seem to be superior beings because they are invisible and can come through walls and appear. Big deal. The earth is here for a reason. You are here for a reason. And one of those reasons is because there. This is where some everything important is happening. Revelation chapter 21 says there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and God the Father will come to live here. Once the whole plan of God is done, you will see Christ to face to face. You will see Christ face to face as, as an individual, and you will see God the Father. You will see Yahweh as an individual. Keel is saying something is going on here. And he does not believe what I believe. The author Jacques Villet wrote a wonderful book called The Messengers of Deception about UFOs. The title speaks for itself. And that is what, this book, what that book is about. The UFO phenomena is a deliberate deception. Jacques Villet wrote an earlier book titled Passport to Mag Magonia on UFOs, Folklore, and Parallel Worlds. This book tells about mass sightings in history from ancient times up to the 1800s, of things in the sky and strange events going on, like, as I described, the saint coming through the village, or as Josephus talks about the strange events that happened before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. 
except these things were written and reported all through history by multiple witnesses. We live in a very busy universe, and God's creation is very complex. The sons of God can certainly breed. The sons of God are a class of beings distinct from other spirit entities, such as angels. The sons of God are the fathers of the Nephilim, who are their offspring. Finally, the sons of God can die like men, Psalm 82, verses 6 and 7, even though they are spirit beings. The sons of God have an ability to become physical, and they can probably do it easier because they have more power than angels and other spirits. We have in Genesis, in the time of Abraham, that Yahweh, who was probably an angel of Yahweh, which is another subject, he came with two angels. They subsequently went to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy those cities. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to have sex with those entities. They knew they were angels. They knew they could have sex with spirit beings, albeit homosexual sex. But they knew that the angels were sexual beings. How did they know that? It's not explained in the text. But the time of Abraham comes after the time, as it says in Genesis 6-4, and after that. Jesus, Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. As For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not, in other words, they knew nothing until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. End quote. This passage, shows, this passage shows us several things. First, life will continue to have a regularity up to just before Christ returns. Second, in Genesis, the only reference to marriage before the flood resulted in hybrid offspring, the Nephilim. Will the sons of God breed again with the daughters of men? Some believe this has been going on for decades. I tend to agree, but I cannot be sure. Oh, look at Wall Street. Look at the city of <laughs> London. Oh. Yeah, but the, the offspring these days are no longer giants. Yeah. And remember, the Anakim are of Adam, Joshua fourteen fifteen, tells us. So, some points to consider. The account of Genesis chapter 6 states that the sons of God successfully bred with the daughters of Adam. Adam. This was because human beings were created a little lower than the Elohim. Psalm 8 and verse 5. David. Now that we were very close to them. Um, I'm well, almost done. <laughs> well, uh, Just a few more sentences. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Who are the Nephilim? They are human like you and me, however strange they may be. All human beings, children of Adam, are destined to have dominion over all creation, to become children of God, Psalm 8, 8 and verse 6. Psalm 77 verse 11 says, I will remember the works of Yahweh. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. And so concludes, Who are the Nephilim? That's Thank a, you, George. That's a wonderful writing, David.